hate the sin, but not the sinner. As a queer person myself, growing up in a Roman Catholic bubble, I heard this often from my parents, and it did hurt my feelings. And I do think it ultimately contributed to my desire to unalive. But the good news was, after therapy and years of recovery, I not only didn't want to unalive, but I actually understood what they meant. There are so many people on the internet that have discussed this very topic. I don't hate the saying, love the sinner, hate the sin, in one very important context. And in another, I absolutely do. The problem that I have with love the sinner, hate the sin, and comes from years and years and years of hearing it used by people in my churches as a way to excuse their bigotry. Because while they would claim to love the person, I don't think that that's true. It is very discussed in very specific religious bubbles. You've probably heard people say that they love the sinner but hate the sin. And like many gay people, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with this phrase. On the one hand, it says that we should love, and that's a good thing. And it reminds us that we can love people in spite of their flaws. On the other hand, it involves a kind of oversimplification. What's the sin in question here? It's about the fundamental relationships around which we organize our lives. It's about how we experience love, as well as pride and shame, joy and sorrow, power and vulnerability, things that are intimately connected with our sense of self. And yet people say, no, it's not you that I'm objecting to. It's your homosexual activity, your homosexual practice, your homosexual conduct. Well, what is heterosexual conduct? And so even putting aside whether homosexual conduct is a sin, and I would argue that it's not, the problem with love the sinner, hate the sin, is that it artificially separates what we do from who we are, when sometimes those things are really inseparable. We talk about this a lot because it's quite painful to hear because we think of ourselves as our actions or our thoughts. But recently, and I did do a video about this, Yale professors reviewed multiple groups and asked them, are you your thoughts or your actions? Or are are you both? And since here in this channel we talk about philosophy a lot, the idea behind that is the desire to introspect, extrospect. Hi, I'm Josh Noob. I'm a professor at Yale University, and I'm going to be talking about the notion of a true self. So let's begin with a classic case of a conflict between belief and emotion. Imagine a man named Mark who has a belief that homosexuality is a sin. So he thinks that it's morally wrong for people to be with others of the same sex, and in fact, he travels the world preaching this message and teaching people techniques they can use to resist same-sex attraction. But now, imagine that Mark has a problem. Mark's problem is that he himself is actually gay. As a result, Mark is feeling a conflict between his beliefs and his emotions. Mm. And the question I want to ask now is, which of those two aspects of him is his true self? Which is the part that really reveals who he himself most truly is deep down inside? When I say there's like a core self in all of us, I believe that. And again, it's not about knowing, it's about believing and then knowing the difference between what you believe and what you know. So many of us, <clears throat> let's say Mark, <laughs> my gay brother Mark somewhere in the world is like, what? <laughs> is this about me? No, it's not about you. But this Mark here in this video, he has a bubble of belief he lives in. And then the bubble in which he has a relationship with his consciousness, all perception is like little mini bubbles to me. So here's the bubble of him and his orientation. And that bubble lives within the bubble of his own belief system that being gay is bad. And so those are like two bubbles that are within, are within conflict in, in perception to one consciousness. So here, different people might have different views. Some people might say, ultimately, your true self is constituted by your beliefs, by your reasoning, by your abstract thinking. So they might say, Mark's true self is a part of him that says that homosexuality is a sin. But then other people might have exactly the opposite view. They might say, your true self is constituted by your emotions, by your visceral desires, by your passions. And then they might say, Mark's true self is the part of him that's drawn toward being with another man. Am I my thoughts or my actions? Am I my beliefs? These are all great questions. And I think in order to be truly introspective, you should ask yourself those questions. And today I wanna to explore that because most communities around the world, I would say all, think of themselves as very loving, truth-seeking, tolerant communities. And yet we differ. There's chaos, there's war, there's differences in politics and what we think is right or wrong. Now, the good news is most communities do think of themselves as good people rather than bad people, which means there's some sort of indication that human beings as an evolved animal species are seeking out goodness 
rather than badness. The badness occurs when my goodness meets your goodness and we disagree on the goodness. And now we have a badness to my goodness, which is why I believe morals are subjective. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think it means we have to evoke those skills that have been given to us through millions of years of evolution to come to better conclusions. Recently in the news, the religious communities are pretty upset in the United States for two reasons. One, Oklahoma school districts desired to have a charter school represented by the Catholic religion and so Catholic themed and were denied permission for funding. And two, Nickelodeon decided to embrace the LGBTQA community by celebrating pride. Here's a symbol in the sky. Pride. And I'm proud to be me every time that I see that pride flag waving high. Now I can understand why these two communities are in conflict. The hell is this? Doesn't it just feel Nickelodeon's target audience is children. Why are children being exposed to this? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to see Nickelodeon and other media outlets support pride communities, and I understand why religious communities feel underrepresented. The dilemma we truly run into, though, is how do we know we are truth-seeking, love-seeking, and tolerant communities if every time someone who's different from us has a moment in the spotlight, we get upset? It can seem from where we sit here in Canada that the rights of LGBTQ people have come a long, long way. It is still far from true, however, in many parts of the world. The small East Asian nation of Brunei, for example, just made same-sex relationships punishable by death. Polls show Mr. Obama enjoys widespread popularity among Kenyans. But the president's visit is not without controversy. You see close to 700 Kenyan evangelical pastors have written an open letter asking the president not to talk about the gay agenda. We do not want him to come and talk on homosexuality in Kenya or push us to accepting to accepting that, which is against our faith and our culture. All right, folks, we are here at the rally to support the natural heterosexual family. Do you think being, a gay, being gay is a choice? It is a choice. I believe that firmly. Um, I have personally have had some bisexual interactions once upon a time, right? And I have repented from those sins because I know that they're wrong. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will go to hell. When you see like a happy gay couple, what do you like? Do you think that they need to find a, a straight partner? I think they need to find Jesus. How do we know the difference from right or wrong? If my good is different from your good, my right is different from your right. Number one, that in Islam, any sexual relationship outside of nikah between a man and a woman is haram. Number two, desires are not sinful nor should people be identified or ostracized by desires, but instead every Muslim is defined by Islam, which is submission to Allah with those desires. Number three, same-sex actions are unequivocally haram. Number four, the one who acts upon those desires is sinful, but within the fold of Islam, so long as they don't justify those acts. Number seven, to celebrate or support what Allah has prohibited is a form of fusuq and cannot be done in the name of social cohesion or political mobility. Number eight, we have and always will condemn mistreatment and violence against people on the basis of orientation, lifestyle, or belief, but that condemnation should not be conflated with making halal what Allah has clearly made haram. For the love the sinner, hate the sin thing, the way I feel about it is I could love pizza and you could not right. like pizza and you're fucking crazy if you don't like pizza. Whatever, we can agree to disagree. But when it comes to like who I am as a person and my rights, mm -hmm. we're not gonna agree to disagree. Hi, my name's Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. Stephanie was raised uh, Catholic. Um, her parents apparently considered the faith deeply enough to send her to Catholic elementary school, I think even Catholic high school. Stephanie, uh, she became her own woman, you know, kind of a situation, got into her chosen profession, and, you know, didn't basically live her Catholic faith. In fact, a lot of the stuff that she said and did would kind of go against a lot of what um, we believe as Catholics. A couple times she posted photos and, and captions from scripture or from mass. I mean, at one point, you know, saying, hey, just went to mass and love Father so-and-so's homily on the Eucharist. And you're like, okay, no, pause. If you were her mom and dad, that'd be like an awesome day. Because right, you know, gosh, I don't know, I'm getting so emotional. They'd be like, oh my gosh, finally. 
like everything we were hoping for, everything we we're praying for while she's going off. And we, we see all her posts, like we see everywhere. It's like, oh, she's not, Steph's not like living up to like what we want her to, to know the truth about her dignity, her beauty. Um, and some people were, some people, you know, on social media were very excited, like, wow, this is awesome. But there were a number of, a number of other people who saw that and said, well, she better not be going to Holy Communion. You know, they, they see the same posts and say, well, she, she better know that, you know, the way she's living is not going with what the Lord teaches. <laughs> and I just think, you know, it's so interesting how quickly we are to look at someone else and say, hey, you're trying to grow? <laughs> Not good enough. The second great commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And when we talk about love the sin or hate the sin, so many people right now, it's kind of a joke. It seems empty. But it's not empty. We do it all the time. See, as Liz points that out, he's like, no, I know exactly what it is to love the sinner and hate the sin because I love myself and I want the best for myself. And yet I still, and I hate, so therefore I hate the sin inside of me. Same kind of thing when it comes to other people, to love the sinner, to love that person who's struggling, that person who needs our grace, who needs our patience, who needs our kindness, but to also hate the thing that's killing them. I just made a fascinating discovery. It turns out if I'm talking to someone who says love the sinner, hate the sin, and I tell them hate the belief, love the believer, they get really upset. Almost as if that phrase was an underhanded way of saying that you don't actually love someone. How do we know the difference from right or wrong if my good is different from your good? My right is different from your right. So obviously a lot of it is data. A lot of it is exploration. A lot of it is disagreement and debate. But more than that, it's a level of open-mindedness that I think is required to change not only one's mind, but to change the world. The question is, does that start with creating media shows, songs, or representation for your children to consume? Or does that start by changing the hearts of the older generations? When we say love the sinner, but not the sin, when we say hate the sin, but not the sinner, we're saying a very specific thing that I think is hard to process unless you grow up in a religious bubble. I think if you're a Christian, I, you're more than familiar with that statement and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, we're supposed to uh, love those that are sinners as Jesus came and he died for sinners. He was a friend of sinners. He ate with sinners. And yet, of course, we're not supposed to love or approve of sin. But here's the problem when it comes to uh, sharing Christ with our gay loved one or neighbor. They're familiar with that statement and most of the time they don't like that statement or they hate that statement. And if you think about it, I mean, if you tell an unbeliever, I love you, but I hate your sin. I always tell people they don't feel loved because it makes sense to us. And the reason why it makes sense to us is because we have a biblical worldview. We have a framework on, in which we understand things. We're able to separate who we are from our sin. When I was, lived as a gay man, my whole world was gay. I lived in an apartment complex that was 90% gay. I shopped at a grocery store that we would nickname the Gay Kroger. I worked out at a uh, a gay gym. All my friends were gay men and the whole world was telling me I am gay. My flesh was telling me I am gay. So when someone told me that I'm living in sin or what I was doing in sin, I didn't hear that what I was doing was sin. I just heard that my whole person, everything about me, my ontology was reprehensible to God and that was offensive. I want to explore this topic as a secular person because I don't believe in God. I left the Catholic Church at 19. I'm now 35. It's been many, many, many years since I've believed in the concept of a God. But I'm also a person who enjoys meditation, spiritualism. I like the idea of valuing life, whether it's a rock, tree, or creature. I do believe we're evolved animals on a planet. I do think we have inherent consciousness, and I even think we have souls. But the soul I believe in is mostly the you that is you and the me that is me. I'm not sure that the soul indicates a God but that thing that makes you, you, and the thing that makes me, me, that's what I call a soul or a consciousness. So as an example, Miss Rachel was recently under fire for something similar, where she wanted to support the Pride community during June, and Christian followers were pretty upset with her. Happy Pride to all of our wonderful families and friends. This month and every month, I celebrate you. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're exactly who you are. To those who are going to comment they can't watch the show anymore because of the support, no worries and much love your way. God bless. 
I am not chasing fame or views. I'm standing strong in love. But the thing that makes Miss Rachel Miss Rachel, the thing that makes her her, that soul or consciousness, that's also the thing that put together a set of values and followed through with representing that part of her community regardless of the backlash. So much of media is catered to the dollar bill. But on top of that, it's also catered to values. Often in America, you'll hear certain groups say that media is corrupting or brainwashing their children. The left-wing gender insanity being pushed on our children is an act of child abuse. Very simple. Here's my plan to stop the chemical, physical, and emotional mutilation of our youth. On day one, I will revoke Joe Biden's cruel policies on so-called gender-affirming care. No homos will ever be allowed on this church as long as I'm the pastor here. Now, to me, LGBT stands for let God burn them. But I think they forget that the media that they also love feels the same way to a different family. And here on Fifth Avenue, people are having a lot of fun, but of course, pride is not just a party, it's a protest. Supporters of Israel March. Bring them home! And so did supporters of Palestine. Politics is on a lot of people's minds. I'm really concerned about LGBTQ rights in this country. I'm really concerned about the way things are moving in the upcoming election. It's very stressful. Like people don't know whether we're going to have rights next year or not. This mom from Harlem is here on behalf of her intersex daughter who recently died. She says HIPAA laws kept her from knowing the truth about her own child. Parents or whoever, no matter what age, should be able to share their mental status. This uncle is here supporting his niece. Why is it so important for you to be here as an ally? Because she's my family. I love her. Okay? I support her and love it a lot. I do truly believe that most people feel underrepresented in media. And more than that, because they feel like they are loving and truth-seeking and tolerant people, they can't imagine that their way of life is the bad decision. You know, this, this idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff. I, you should get over that quickly. The world, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. People who you are fighting may love their kids and share certain things with you. And, and, and I think that one danger I see among young people, particularly on college campuses, but I do get a sense sometimes now among certain young people, and this is accelerated by social media, there is this sense sometimes of the way of me making change is to be as judgmental as possible about other people. And that's enough. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right, then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself. Cause man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. Now, of course, everything we end up doing is a part of our nature because we ourselves are nature. Now, of course, if you believe that a God puts you on the planet or maybe aliens put you here, or this is a simulation, you're going to have a different relationship with your why and your values, which also contributes to the chaos of the world. I'm not saying that one way is better than the other, but I am trying to encourage us to recognize that we all live in bubbles. We are all very different. And I think that this is the key to the chaos. And I'm not saying we should all be the same. I'm saying we should really understand that we're not all the same. We are all very different people with different values and experiences and maybe even what you would call perceptions of reality. But at the end of the day, if you've got a person who believes in evolution and a person who doesn't. The earth round or flat? Or is flat. Do you think the Earth is round or flat? I know we didn't go to the moon. We didn't go to the moon? No, we didn't go to the moon. Why, why do you say that? You can't get out of the atmosphere. Earth round or flat? Well, you know the answer to that. Can you tell me what you think? Please just answer me, please. No, 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 because I want to know. Tell me. Cause, you know, I believe the Earth is round. From NASA's pictures, right? Yeah. Okay. And you, you know of CH, CGI, right? I've heard of CGI, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I believe in a Bible in Genesis under the dome. It plainly tells you there, under firmament, dome. So it's, you know, as flat as a pancake. Or maybe you're the superintendent in the Oklahoma school district who has now made it mandatory to teach the Bible for fifth through 12th graders. Tonight we begin with the latest in our state education leaders push for Christian religion in public schools after a major Oklahoma Supreme Court decision this week denying a religious charter school. State Superintendent Ryan Walters doubled down by requiring all Oklahoma educators to teach the Bible effective immediately. The Supreme Court has made some horrendous decisions. This is one of the worst. This week, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled the Oklahoma State Department of Education must end its contract with St. Isidore, stating it is unconstitutional. It would be the nation's first religious charter school. This would have been the most unique charter school in the country. 
So I want you all to know we will continue to fight back against this. I know that feels like a good decision and maybe it is for your family, friends and community. But of course, I'm sure you would feel violated if we also required fifth through 12th graders to learn about sex education, queer pride or history. At the end of the day, what's good for me isn't good for you. And we need to have a real conversation about that. So in order to explore the idea of hate the sin, love the sinner in a modern way, I kind of want to talk about your dog. We love our dogs. Our dogs are so special to us and they mean so much to us. Our animals are precious that are part of our family and yet if our dog got upset and bit us, it would make sense that we would be upset with the sin, the biting, but also love the dog, the sinner. This is the idea that I use to understand all of life. I think we are real individuals. Like I am me and you are you. And I think past your actions and even your thoughts, there is a you that exists. And that you is very important and special. Now, in order to understand the you that exists past those things, we also have to understand that we live in moments. Your dog isn't a bad dog dog, but it did a bad thing in the moment that it bit you. And because your dog is a unique consciousness as an animal, it isn't just a bad dog. It's also a good dog and a complicated dog and a nuanced dog. And your dog, even though he bit you, shouldn't be represented as that dog stuck in time as the dog who bites people. We should consider who he was before and after. We should consider their character as a whole over time. And sometimes life doesn't go perfectly and we have an old yeller situation. Ideally though, we would be able to treat our animals with the compassion that they deserve. Now deserve is a very complicated word and I talk about it often in my work. I don't think anyone deserves anything Thing, that doesn't mean we shouldn't show kindness to people. It's not about deserving or entitlement. It's about what's good and moral and healthy. Treating people with kindness and compassion, which means to suffer with, is a call to empathy. It's an encouragement of good behavior. Empathy is understanding something deeply profound about another person's experience and it being as important as your own experience. Sympathy is more or less the logical understanding of someone's experience, which is devoid of that intimate embodiment. I'll, I'll put it this way. Any man who would have sex with a man would have sex with an animal. You are fake news. So when Christians get upset seeing trans people or LGBT people being represented through Nickelodeon, you have to remember that the same way you feel when you don't see Christians depicted in media in a way that makes you feel seen, that's how queer people feel. When we don't see ourselves depicted in media that makes us feel seen, we feel rejected. And you might say to yourself, you should be rejected because you're sinning and we're not rejecting you, we're rejecting the sin. But then that brings into question, how do you know when something is a sin? Now, this is where we have a reality clash. And again, I don't want to push the narrative that religious people are out of their minds or secularists are just working for Satan. I instead want to encourage us to recognize that we do view words differently, that words change via culture expectations and perceptions of reality are going to differ from person to person. And so sin is sort of this immoral act against the divine law. But divine law implies some sort of immortal being or some sort of divine being, which I don't believe in. So now we have a problem with the word sin. What is even a sin if it only exists within the framework of a bubble? And I don't live in that bubble with you, so what am I supposed to do with that? Well, the reality is, is that we live in different bubbles, but sharing the same country or city or state or globe. And it's not like humans don't know this. We do know this about ourselves. Regardless of how you think we got to planet Earth, we do exist here and culture does shift and things modernize over time. I think ultimately the thing that is so painful for all of us is the acknowledgement that we do think we are truth seekers, that we do believe in love and we think of ourselves as tolerant. So why can't we get along with other people? And it really is a moral difference. It's a different of moral expectation and the ethics that surround that. If my morals are this and their morals are that, then their society would be different from mine as my society is different from theirs. And society is supposed to be this safe space in which we can exist and raise our children. And then of course, hope for a future that will be good for them. And right now, I think a lot of us feel displaced about the possibility of that good future. And a lot of that is because we are learning things so quickly thanks to the internet. And we are also having realizations that the world isn't like us. And that feels scary. The world isn't like me. The world must be bad. But also, what if you're a part of that bad? But also, what if we're all just different? What is the difference between a sin and a person who's just different from you? This is a matter of how you see the world and how that plays into cohabitation with your neighbors. We all exist amongst each other. We all in a way cohabitate because we share the same streets, libraries, schools. Our kids are going to socialize together 
So we're like sort of society roommates, if you will. And roommates, as you know, sometimes steal each other's food and don't pay their bills on time, or sometimes don't clean their room enough, or maybe they invite guests over to the house that they don't like. Maybe the roommate just talks throughout the night and never sleeps, or maybe, 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 maybe it's never perfect. It was never gonna be perfect, and I certainly don't wanna advocate for perfection. So what do we do when we're imperfect? We have difference of values and perceptions of belief, and we all think we're the good guys. I recommend introspection, extrospection, having a relationship with the self, and everything outside of the self. Having a realization that everyone is just as valuable as you are is a really scary notion because every time you do wrong to somebody else, you are doing wrong to yourself. Now, the golden rule is to treat people the way that you wanna be treated. And I think that's fundamentally correct. And yet some people don't wanna be treated like you. So then what do you do? That's where the nuance comes in. We wanna treat people with the kindness and compassion we would like people to treat us with, but then we have to treat people with that. And that's where it becomes difficult. How do you look at your enemy in the eye and treat them with love and compassion? Which leads us to asking ourselves, why do we even have enemies in the first place? Well, I only have an enemy because they started it. I'm sure every parent here who has multiple kids has heard that before. Nickelodeon supporting pride is a beautiful thing to see as a queer person who grew up her whole life feeling like queer people were seen as demonic, when in reality, we're just your daughters. We're just your sons. We're just your children. We're not demons. We're your offspring. We're not demons. We love our parents as much as any other kid. And I know our parents love us. At least I know mine loves me. But I also know that the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And my parents had very good intentions and they still do. And even though they're right wing, Trump voting Republicans, (laughs) and even though they're anti LGBT QA, and even though they're not going to be happy about Nickelodeon doing what they're doing, We find a way to live amongst each other and to make it work. It's not perfect. But I know at the core of my parents, they love. They do want to know what the truth is, and they're trying to be tolerant. It's just a struggle. And to be honest with you, it's a struggle for me too. I am struggling, as I think we all are at all times, to love people so different from us, to be tolerant, and to figure out what is the truth. What is the truth of all of this? I don't think we know, and I do think thinking we know is the problem. We're humans collecting data and trying different things to figure out what is good for our kids, what is good for our society. Nickelodeon is trying something new, as I think they should. And honestly, if religious communities want to give us media that's consumable and relatable, I think we would like that too. The dilemma, in the same way that religious people feel alienated from queer media, queer people feel alienated from religious media. We're just not seeing each other. So we're not vibing. We're not getting it. We're not having a moment of, ah, you get me. We're having the opposite, a fear reaction, a fear outcome. You don't understand me, which is scary because I feel like I'm communicating really well, which means you're either the crazy one or I am. But instead of crazy, just different types of humans, neither good nor bad, just different, which brings us down to, again, my good is in your good. So how do we know what's good for society? It probably is good for society that it embraces LGBTQA people. It's probably good for society that we have religious outlets for people and communities in which they can grow and raise children. I think it's also good for people to have options, for people to have choice, even if that choice disrupts your version of what's right or wrong. And of course, there has to be a line in the sand in which as a society, I think we all universally agree, this X, Y, Z isn't appropriate. But see how this X, Y, Z is what's a mystery? What's the thing I could name right here on this camera in which we would all agree, we're not gonna tolerate this? I would love to say it would be something like child brides, but that's not true because there are child brides. There are plenty of states in the United States of America that are allowing teenagers to get married right now. So we don't even agree on that. So then we have to ask ask ourselves, even though we say we care about the children, to what degree? Because as of right now, too many teenagers are getting married. As of right now, too many people are going unfunded when they really need the help and support. Right now, there are too many children in foster care that could be adopted out to loving families. Because right now, your child is crying in their room and self-harming because of the way you decided to convey your religious belief or maybe even secular belief in the household in which that child lives. Ultimately, all children are born into environments that may or may not be good for them. And as parents or older siblings or aunties or uncles, 
as the community, we have to pay attention to those children and give them an environment that's safe for them. And sometimes that means an environment in which Nickelodeon or Miss Rachel acknowledges their existence as queer kids. And I do understand fundamentally that you might exist in a bubble where you truly don't believe queer people exist, but in that bubble you exist in, your neighbors also don't believe in your God. So we have to figure out a compromise because we just don't believe the same. That doesn't mean we can't act with dignity or compassion. It doesn't mean we can't work on being more tolerant and it doesn't mean we don't get the opportunity to disagree and maybe even make fun of each other. But ultimately, the way you feel about queer people is the way queer people feel about you. And of course, even when I say that, I know I'm not speaking for every single queer or religious person. Nobody is a monolith, not even those of faith, not even those of the queers. But I think both groups have faith that humanity will continue to get better because I've seen it get so much better in my lifetime. But that's because people made the effort. We have to make the effort. So as the religious continue to practice loving the sinner, not the sin, I too as a queer person will continue to love the sinner, not the sin. It's just in my book, I'm identifying the sinner as a person who's anti-LGBT and civil rights, I really do believe that we're two sides of the same coin, which means we're the same. If you study philosophy, if you look into religion, if you look into belief systems around the world, it's obvious we are the same. But I don't know if we've really embodied that reality, if we've really accepted that we're the same. Because it's so hard when I watch Nickelodeon and I'm dancing to the song and someone else watches Nickelodeon and they're fearing for their life. We are having different relationships with reality, but we are still the same. Life is a fool.